We turn to my distinguished ranking member, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all our witnesses. I will not be a part of any effort that is intended to or has the consequence of destabilizing the institution of the United States Supreme Court or our federal judiciary. I won't do it. I will not be a part of any effort to change the United States Supreme Court because I do not like the way that it is voting. Um, the integrity court is as important as the integrity of this body. It is as important as the integrity of the executive branch. It is as important as the integrity of the United States Constitution. Judges are not supposed to be politicians with robes. Judges are not supposed to tell us what the law ought to be. They are supposed to tell us what the law is. That doesn't mean that sometimes judges don't make law. What's reasonable or unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment uh, is, a, is a topic that our judges have to, uh, have, have to assess every day. But they have to, or at least they should assess it, with an open mind and with an understanding of the purpose of that constitutional amendment. Now, this is America. You're entitled to believe what you want. And uh, you're entitled to say it. <clears throat> I don't much agree with, uh, with, with my uh, woker fellow Americans who think they're smarter and more virtuous than the American people, who think they have a monopoly on the truth. I believe that I believe they have the right to say what they want to, but I also believe you don't have the right. You're not really free if you don't if you can't express yourself if you can't say what you think. Um, so I, I'm not suggesting that this is not a topic that we shouldn't talk about. In fact, I'm interested in hearing what all of you have to say, particularly about the the consequences if any, of this legislation on the separation of powers. I think that's a, I'm, I'm, I'm rather fond of the Constitution. I'm rather fond of the part about the three branches of government. I'd like to maintain them. I'd like to lift up the institutions uh, of the Constitution, including the United States Supreme Court. I'm not interested in tearing them down because I don't happen to like the way they vote. Um, dark money has been mentioned repeatedly. Um, a great deal of money is being spent by conservatives, moderates, liberals in America. They have the right to spend that money to petition their government. Uh, I, I don't think it's fair just to blame one particular side. You know, the American people aren't stupid. They're not morons. They may not read Aristotle every day because they're too busy earning a living. But the American people can see that all sides are represented in this so-called dark money. Um, I've been disappointed in the way the Supreme Court has voted before. I've been uh, reading Supreme Court opinions um, since I was in law school. Um, and I realize what you're thinking. You know, life is short. Kennedy would get, should get one. But I enjoy reading Supreme Court opinions. For the longest time, it was part of my job when I, was, when I taught in law school. Some of them I agree with. Some of them I don't. 
but I have never and never will attack the institution of the United States Supreme Court. Now, we're about to find out what our Department of Justice is made of. We have had an unprecedented leak. Unprecedented. As despicable as it is dangerous at the United States Supreme Court. And for those who don't understand how the United States Supreme Court works internally, this it's not like the United States Congress where thousands of people could have access to a document. This is a very finite group of folks who could have had access to that document. And this leak, regardless of whether you agree with the draft opinion or disagree, has seriously undermined the confidence that we all have in the United States Supreme Court. We're about to find out what the United States Department of Justice is made of because it can find this leaker if it wants to. And once that leaker is found, that person should be fired. That person should be disbarred. That person should be the defendant and whomever cares to bring a civil lawsuit. And that person should be prosecuted. That person also has a pretty difficult decision to make here in the next few days. I hope, hope that I'm accurate, believe I'm accurate, in suggesting that every person who had access to this document that they leaked, that was leaked, is going to get a visit by the FBI. And the person who leaked this document is going to have to either tell the truth or lie to an FBI agent which subjects them to criminal prosecution. So let's, let's hope that our Department of Justice does its job and uh, in, in at least a small way tries to restore a little bit of, of the integrity that this, uh, this misguided zealot who leaked this document um, took away from the American people. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. It's an interesting separation of powers question. Why FBI agents from the executive branch should be running around within the Supreme Court interviewing clerks and staff and justices themselves um, if it's not appropriate for Congress to exercise its legislative powers with regard to those standards. So it will be interesting to see that. Well, let me respond to that, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, the United States Supreme Court has its own police force. And I don't think it's at all uncommon to have police forces cooperate. And what I hope happens, everybody's entitled to his opinion, but what I hope happens is that, that uh, the authorities at the Department of Justice, who I believe will be called in, should be called in, put the full force and power of their agency to find out who leaked this document and to prosecute that person civilly and criminally to the full extent of the law. I don't care who it is. I don't care what their politics is. This isn't right. And I guess we'll begin by trying to identify what law that person might have violated. Let me turn to Chairman Durbin to uh, make his opening statements. Senator Kennedy. That's okay, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, I've enjoyed your testimony. <clears throat> um, Professor Frost, I take it that you think the... Uh, the recusal provisions that the United States Supreme Court uses are inadequate. I'm, I'm interested in, in learning more about that. Um, do, do you think they undermine, they meaning the recusal provisions that the United States Supreme Court undermine the integrity of the court? 
I do. And I think that what is unfortunate is there's some easy ways to fix and change this, which of course is, is in Congress's hands um, by adding procedures to the recusal statute. Right. Let me ask you, what do you think undermines the integrity of the United States Supreme Court more in your judgment? Um, it's recusal provisions or a member of the United States Senate going to the steps of the Supreme Court and threatening justices by name if they don't rule the way he wants on Roe v. Wade. So I take it that this hearing is to consider a bill and to consider possible legislative reform to improving the way the court operates and protecting actually all the Article III courts. So that's going to be the focus of my testimony. And here's what this institution could yes, do. Yes, ma'am, but first, could you answer my question? So your question is whether people speaking out against the court is more damaging to no, the court? No, wasn't than my question. My question is, what do you think undermines the integrity of the United States Supreme Court? The inadequacy, in your opinion, of its recusal provisions or having a member of the United States Senate go on the steps of the United States Supreme Court in front of God and country and threaten justices by name if they do not vote the way he wants them to vote on Roe v. Wade. So, Senator, unfortunately, over the last decade, particularly the last five years or so, I have seen the court come under attack from so many different sources. Yes, ma'am, but what about that particular? That, I think that's a problem. I would certainly not support a senator criticizing the court. It's also a problem when the Senate of the United States will not confirm a nominee for over a year, leaving the court at eight justices. And it's also a problem when Congress will not amend existing legislation to improve the process of recusal so that all of the justices can weigh in on a recusal decision right. and protect the integrity of that court. All of those are a problem. Let me ask each of you this. You're all students. Well, first, I'm going to call you professor anyway. I think you're qualified to be a professor, Professor Payne. You mentioned uh, ethical misconduct. I'm sorry, ethical misconduct by the United States Supreme Court justices. Can you give me examples in the last 20 years of specific acts of ethical misconduct by the United States Supreme Court justices? I, I can definitely send you the allegations of misconduct. And in, in the Supreme Court, the perception of misconduct has the same impact as actual yeah. misconduct. But, but I'm asking for actual acts of misconduct. Because there's no body to make the legal decision whether something is actual misconduct, I can't point to a decision that's been made. I can only give you the allegations of the potential misconduct, which includes uh, failure to recuse and improper travel. Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask each of you this, because I consider all of you students of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, what do you think will, will be the impact on the United States Supreme Court and people's respect for it as a result of this leak about the draft opinion in the Mississippi abortion case? We'll start on this end, and then I'll let... Professor Payne, rest a minute. <laughs> it was already on. You know, it's an empirical question. I really couldn't say. I think that the um, the the leak, the the substance of the leak, which shows that the court is going against the majority of the country, is much more damaging to the legitimacy than the leak itself. Thank you, Professor. Well, the leak last night is obviously outrageous and should be taken very seriously, but I have a lot of confidence in the court and the American public, and I think that the Supreme Court is going to rise above the circumstance and, as it's done for decades, apply the rule of law and issue a decision that it believes reflects the uh, constitutional principles in the Dobbs case and, and all others and trust that the Chief Justice and the court will be able to um, resolve and issue an, an honest opinion uh, quickly. Okay. Professor Frost. I think the leak was uh, unethical, but I do not think it will damage the court. And I think far more damaging to the court was the failure to fill a seat for nearly a year um, when uh, a nominee by then President Obama was pending and not acted upon. Okay. Professor? 
you're a professor too. Thank you. I think the leak was seismic, devastating, and heartbreaking. It should go without saying that the Supreme Court can fulfill its Article Three responsibility if drafts of opinions are leaked and circulated for what appear to be political purposes. That said, I do think the Supreme Court is fully capable of keeping its eye on the ball and deciding this case ultimately through a final official published opinion in the way that the law and the Constitution command. Professor Payne. Uh, I think the leak was highly inappropriate, and it also raises the question of what are the specific rules that apply to the uh, officials and the employees in the Supreme Court because it's not clear about their duty of confidentiality as opposed to the duty of confidentiality following the other clerks across the uh, lower courts. Okay, thanks to you all.